um, uh, thank you for your uh, invitation and for having me. Um, a very nice open invitation to the community, so to speak. And um, it's amazing that you organize uh, all these uh, get-togethers online. Um, now, what I want to do for uh, this afternoon, and, and thank you all who is here with, uh, with the whole group for joining in. I mean, it's such a beautiful day, at least here in Europe. Very hot, even in Amsterdam, where I am now. Um, and what I wanted to do was not just to focus on Bakema uh, and the Open Society historically, although I will do that, but I came up with the subject, the topic, because of the events of today, of course, what's happening in America in particular. Uh, it's quite astonishing to see it from uh, this side of uh, the Atlantic. Uh, but also in Europe, uh, how the open society is being weaponized by the right at the moment uh, to try and establish a whole new discourse is quite uh, unsettling. Uh, so what I want to do is to embark on my use, the notion of the open society most explicitly in his work to build towards uh, a more democratic and egalitarian society and how architecture and planning can work towards an inclusive uh, society. Um, and what I wanted to do is because it's not a straightforward concept, not at all. It's more like a project or a process. Um, it's never finished. The open society as such is, uh, at least for Bakema, it's never a finished project. Um, and what I want to show is the ambivalences at stake, because he will use the term in very different contexts to address different problems and questions. Uh, and for him, it is a way to relate the big questions of architecture and planning to social issues, uh, urgent issues, issues that are related to emancipation of lower classes and the big masses to create inclusive cities and decent housing in particular for everyone. But this notion of openness, it's, it's very well known from the period, the 50s and 60s. You might know it from the Umberto Eco uh, um, uh, writings, the Opera Aperta, uh, the open work, but also Oscar Hansen from the Team 10 uh, group uh, used uh, the open form. Um, and also the Smithsons talked about open aesthetics as so many did actually. Open systems is the one that is very popular in those days. Um, so I'll share the screen for now. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, full screen. So I brought way too much. So Alice, please uh, intervene when I talk too much uh, and I have to stop. Um, and I will use Bakma then as, as a kind of uh, thread going and touching on several issues, uh, always going back to architecture, of course, but how architecture planning relate to these notions of uh, democracy and welfare states. Um, and trying to build uh, an inclusive society. Uh, his Bakema, Ja Bakema, uh, born in 1914 um, uh, from the north of the Netherlands and from a, a lower class background, it's important to know, I think. Um, and he graduated with Mart Stam in Amsterdam. So he's definitely uh, someone who was brought up, a third generation architect of the modern architecture tradition. Um, we started this project into the open society uh, as a response to Rem Kolha's question for the Biennale in Venice. Uh, this was 2014. So this was two years before the Brexit vote and two years before Trump got voted in. And the open society to bring it to the Biennale was more or less a neutral thing in a way. Um, and it was the question of Rem Kolas was what, what did a hundred years, a century of modernizing your country, uh, what sort of architecture concept or contribution is there 
to reflect on for that particular Biennale exhibition. And he put this question to all the national pavilions, as you know, uh, maybe, which, yeah, I thought it was quite a big success because you got a kind of shared, um, yeah, discourse between all pavilions rather than the usually very fragmented approach uh, of uh, the gigantic uh, event that the Biennale is. Uh, so th th there it comes from. But then when you think of Brexit, already the vote four years ago, Trump also voted in four years ago, uh, yeah, and all the subse subsequent events, uh, this notion of the open society became much more politicized than I actually had expected and much more urgent. So looking at those various contexts in which Bakema then tries to uh, instrumenta instrumentalize this word, word, the open society, I will talk a little bit uh, about it, where he got it from in my view. This is Berlin. This is one of the contexts in the 60s. So Cold War uh, politics in Europe is very important. This is the Hansa Viertel district, of course. Um, the tower that was block that was designed by Bakema together with Jan Stockler is here. Uh, here you see it uh, under construction. Apparently it was the most difficult or most expensive one because it's still being built while the others are already finished. Um, it's still a, a very interesting project to look at how a special typology is uh, translated into an architectural icon where notions of uh, differentiation and uh, yeah, what is called in the Team 10 discourse, the aesthetic of number uh, then results in this uh, tower block. It's still an excellent shape. This is, as this, is, this is the rhetoric of the Cold War. This is the moment, this is even before the war, wall was built, end of the 50s. Uh, but the Karl Marx Allee, the socialist realism is then also uh, constructed. And uh, East Berliners are much, are quite ahead of the West Berliners, to be honest. This is a project for uh, Yugoslavia, the former Republic of Yugoslavia. Uh, 65, an earthquake hit Skopje. Um, and now the UN was brought in by Tito. Uh, Tito was one of the leaders of the non-aligned countries. So again, we have a Cold War context, but quite different. He had sort of a socialist country, but managed to stay out of the communist bloc. And Bakema and Tanga uh, were invited from outside. And there were a few uh, uh, Yugoslavian architects too. Another context is in Israel. This is for Tel Aviv, also a big uh, competition. 64, Tel Aviv and Jaffa. Um, so part of you could say the Zionist project for Israel. And this is one of those moments where the ambivalence is very uh, striking because uh, the office of Bakma totally overlooked uh, the issue of uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the oppression of uh, Palestinians and the removal of Palestinians. Uh, it was one of the reasons why the project didn't uh, get a prize because uh, the jury was afraid that this wall, this mega structure, would, um, uh, yeah, would create, a fixate such a segregation. And this is for the Netherlands in Eindhoven. A sort of, um, yeah, also a mega structure project. Uh, as you can tell, this is an exhibition for the Van Abbe Museum to get the locals involved. Uh, for that time, this is uh, 1969, uh, a big project for that city. And what you're looking at is, is, is a mega structure ID. So this is not quite a building, these are access points and pipes and installations. And here you see an X-ray image of what might be possible, a sort of superstructure that can accommodate all sorts of functions. So it's not a functionalist scheme, but it is there for housing, for shops, for offices, and it could change. And this was rejected because of uh, a problem with uh, finances and accountability. 
So the Minister of Finance would not support it because it was not clear where the budgets of the welfare state would go. So budgets for housing, budgets for offices, etc. Because it was flexible, it was too flexible. So very different context uh, and all talking about a new sort of openness. And the most monumental one is 64. This is for Amsterdam, the Pampas Plan in Dutch, Pampas Plan in English, <laughs> the Pampas Scheme. This is the little island of Pampas, an old fortress, and here's the old inner city. And there's a transport spine around which the whole new city for 350,000 inhabitants uh, is planned for. So the old city, the canals, of course, here, and almost in a rhetorical gesture, this super scale of uh, the Pampas scheme. So it's a highly integrated waterscape uh, that combines both the metropolitan, like this, so definitely not a functional city ID with separation of functions, but almost a culture of congestion that Kohlhaas will uh, pursue in the 70s. And here at the back uh, side, an uh, open view on the Dutch landscape, the Dutch waterscape, flat and wet. <laughs> uh, but it has its own prettiness. Um, this is the moment that Bakema coins that term, building towards, building for an open society. It's for uh, an exhibition in the Museum Boymans van Beuningen in Rotterdam. It's not explained at all. Uh, it's only every now and then touched upon. Also in this book, uh, this little book is from, made out of a TV series. Here is also 62, 63. He speaks on national television about planning issues in the Netherlands. And he speaks about, yeah, what a modern democratic nation, uh, yeah, what, what it should do to build proper cities for everyone. This is one of the famous diagrams, almost cliche-like, but it's important to show again because it talks about how Bakema views architecture as something interrelated, something relational between the buildings, between the scales, uh, between the buildings and the environment, of course, between the buildings and the people. So it's a social idea that's being put forward and without the people, there's no buildings. Uh, so the idea of autonomy is very far, that will become so popular with postmodernism and the, uh, in the 70s, is far removed from him. And this is one of the other diagrams that pops up in his uh, writings and projects. It talks about a, 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 a long development, a long line of development, basically coming from the 19th century and industrialization and moving forward. And he would talk about total urbanization, planetary urbanization. Um, and what is very important to realize here, it's not just the growth in scale and the infrastructure, but there are these connotations, what is private and what is public. And for Bakema clearly to ensure that you have an open society, you need a vast public sector. So all the infrastructure and transport is public. Uh, it's very much, um, yeah, bubbly-like, <laughs> shopping, living, working. But base, the basic notion, I think, or what's important to stress here is the importance of what is public and who controls it, who owns it. It's, uh, this is, of course, the Smithsons, Alison P. Smithsons, uh, one of the drawings they made for Golden Lane. And here you see too a basic structure that is taken over and accommodates uh, everyday life. Streets in the air. Uh, so this is also what the Smithsons will propose in the early team 10 years, that you need a basic structure that accommodates a maximum freedom to allow for growth and change. Those are their words.
The project that embodied uh, in the early years uh, this idea of open society was in Rotterdam, the Lijnbaan shopping center, one of the earliest uh, pedestrianized inner city shopping streets, different scales. It immediately makes clear it's related to the Second World War in Rotterdam, of course, and the devastation of the Second World War and how the Second World War came out of a clash of uh, authoritarian regimes, to put it mildly. And here's the rebuilding of the Langban. Here you see the shops, all individual shop owners, individually owned too. So the welfare state is a hybrid construction. It's not a socialist construction. It's very important to say this because people, especially in America, keep saying that the welfare state is socialist. It's not. It's a mixed economy. Very important to realize this. So these are private shop owners. Uh, and then there are, of course, uh, housing projects by housing corporations, but also for uh, homeowners. Uh, this is also important that shopping and living and working are being combined in the new, uh, as different from the pre-war modernism. And of course, the Marcel Breuer, Bayenkorf, department store, and the Naum Gabo sculpture here. Um, it's very different today. <laughs> because urbanization also continuing and densification in Rotterdam is at the peak right now. And this is one of those beautiful drawings by the project architect Frans van Gogh. Um, yeah, I find it terribly uh, inspiring and beautiful. Space, light, also a little bit of, uh, I suppose, American glamour. Um, the Dutch were looking at American shops and American architecture at that time. Van der Broek went to America immediately 47 to look at shopping developments there. But it's also small scale and the small scale is related to the big scale. So this notion of reciprocity, the small to the large, etc., the intimate to the urban, uh, it always has to be there. This is a project much later uh, still Dutch, the Osaka Pavilion, 1970. So it's a jump of about 17 years. Um, it's uh, related to another project of Bakema for Rotterdam. This, uh, what, what is today the Euromas, built by Maaskant, he didn't win, and he had designed viewing platforms to uh, educate the citizens of Rotterdam. So each platform is a bit Patrick Geddes. Each platform relates to a scale level, the city, the port, the Rhine Delta, and then uh, Europe or the world. And this is translated in this pavilion done with Karel Weber and uh, Wim Krauel, uh, Dutch designer, and a set of artists like Peter, Pet, uh, Peter Struiken. And this was really for Bakema, uh, a statement of ideology almost. Uh, I read out for you. This is in the archive. We have all these notes of Bakema there. Uh, his archive is there and he would um, of course uh, reflect on his project uh, much more than uh, other uh, Dutch modernists I would say. Uh, the Netherlands, a country that is planning its change. Very Dutch notion I think. An open society, an open economy in 1970. So this is the shift to the neoliberal uh, situation. I think even though there's not a common market or world trade organization really there, it talks about the dikes and how we have to control land, water, space, how the people work together. Uh, it talks about planning, it talks about knowledge economy, it talks about the science and the arts, um, and it talks then about the uh, Globalization. 1969 is also the moment that the launch of the 747 jumbo jet is there. Jumbo jet is really the icon of the globalization, I think, of the world, making mass uh, transport available. Schiphol is there. Also, the Fokker Fellowship is there. KLM is there. The big uh, Dutch brands, Philips, Unilever, which is now moving to London for some reason. Uh, and then there's also an aesthetic program, grass, flowers, and cornfields, air and light. And that's related to Rembrandt, of course, and Mondrian and Van Gogh. And then there's a funny other term there, and that's Provo. And I don't know how much you are aware of Provo, uh, but this is completely different from, let's say, this 
branding of the Dutch uh, uh, modern uh, society. Provo is protest. Provo is provocation. It's the 60s, mid 60s. This is the smoke bomb that was thrown at the royal wedding of then Prince Beatrix, Princess Beatrix. And here are some of the provos and the police, of course, and their white bikes, a shared bike scheme uh, to fight car uh, uh, pollution. And uh, very uh, forward looking. It's not theorists there, it's not like situationism, it's locals and artists working together. It's very Dutch, very hands on, very pragmatic. Uh, no, uh, let's say, a difficult French. Uh, concepts are being put into place and no uh, Italian rigor uh, or German uh, thoughtfulness. Uh, but it's quite astonishing that Bakema, being one of the most important architects at that time, who then gets the job to represent the Netherlands in Japan, uh, at the, uh, also at the invitation of Kenzo Tanga, who's the supervisor, that he includes counterculture. So th this is Bakema's notion of the open society, trying to be inclusive, accepting that it's about contestations and discussions. Um, so it's close to what Chantal Mouffe, I think, is uh, presenting to us in her ideas of democracy, that you have to understand democracy as something of a fight, a criticism, a contestation, um, and that you need places or a structure to fight out these, uh, fight off these contestations indeed. Um, so how does that translate into architecture? Uh, two examples, one on housing and one on the center space, public space. Uh, first, the housing. This is uh, a project that Bakma developed uh, together with Lotte Stambeze, uh, the, the wife, the former wife of Mark Stam, after she divorced, she uh, became uh, uh, the head designer in the Rotterdam uh, department. Uh, and they were looking at how to develop uh, a basic building block, so to speak, of uh, housing development. And what's crucial to understand in the Dutch situation, uh, it's not, not to make it perfect, the Dutch thing, but it's completely different social housing, the model, than it is in France or in England or in America. So this is not about containing the working class or ghettoizing uh, 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 black culture or black people. This is about mixing people, mixing households and mixing uh, lifestyles, albeit in a 50s way, right? So at the smallest level, which is then the perimeter block, which is opened up in a very modernist way, you get smaller families and singles, you get bigger families, and you get elderly people all put together into one building block. And how that is articulated in space and architecture, that's the key to develop the whole housing district. And what is uh, guarantees this is well it's of course my interpretation or my uh, let's say interpretation uh, is that at the lowest level of the district the block you always have a certain level of mixing and diversifying of walks of life in this way uh, here is it as it is built this is renovated now so it's quite different now I think this whole zone is uh, has changed and I'm not sure uh, how these are renovated. Still ruthless towards the old landscape, as you can see, is a bit of the old landscape. And then you get in the archive and in the debates, also in the CIOM and Team 10, how then do you make out of these smaller things a bigger thing? How do you articulate uh, space? How do you articulate a community or a new uh, district with these elements? Endless. This is just a handful of stuff. And Bakema came up with the visual group. So the smaller things uh, and then going to the bigger things always related also to landscape notions. Uh, traffic, high speed traffic is here, slow uh, traffic is here. Um, here you can see the visual group, he called it. And it was a tool to develop these districts. This was not 
commonly shared in the Netherlands or in the architecture world. This is again Frans van Gaal, the project architect of the Lijnbaan, who then worked for the Van der Broek and Bakum office. This is in Amsterdam, the north of Amsterdam, Amsterdam North. Het breed en het laag, it's called. This is 1100 houses, uh, all built uh, in this one, let's say, go, one stretch of building. Uh, it's a beautiful project, it's still there. It's one of the successes, the success stories of the welfare state, you might say. Of course, it needs maintenance and proper upgrading, as any building does. But uh, it's, it's uh, still there and it's in perfect shape, I would say. It had a renovation a couple of years ago. Um, streets in the air, <laughs> lots of repetition. Maybe it reminds you of this. So the Smithsons are, I think the Smithsons had pretty much influence and impact on Dutch architecture, at least the development of these key projects. Again, a facade that talks of repetition and a housing project that is completely about diversity. So that the differentiation of housing types behind the concrete screen is quite astonishing. And you don't get that usually in developments of today. Here's some drawings in color. And here again, the notion of how do you articulate such ideas in a facade and in architecture. Um, now, for Bakema, this notion of the visual group, bringing the small and the bigger together in these visual groups, it becomes almost like a planetary urbanism, as I said, it's incredibly big scale. This is the Alexander Polder, and the Polder as such as a rationalized allotment system uh, lends itself perfect for this uh, yeah, super radical approach to planning. Uh, and it can expand into the landscape. So it talks about extension integrated into the landscape. So it's also a reconceptualization of the Dutch landscape. Here you see again the Alexander Polder with 11 super buildings. It's in 53, 1953. Infrastructure and the megastructure, the megastructure is only 10 years later, that debate. But this is a, a pre, uh, precursor to that debate. So from the small scale, the grow something, so to speak. Of course, it's a reinterpretation of the unité as well. But this here, it's written collective spaces. So it's, a, yeah, so it's again, as this mega structure diagram I showed you in the beginning, this, this is Bakema's ID and proposition. Yeah, again, the idea of the reconceptualization of the Dutch landscape. It's built in Leeuwarden, Hengelo, Eindhoven, many places. Parts of it is also demolished again. Okay, this housing, how to articulate housing, how to build housing for an inclusive society. Uh, let's move on to public space, collective space. This is Nagele. This is by Aldo van Eyck, of course. Very beautiful, poetic project. Uh, this is one of the famous drawings. And I want to ask attention for this open space. Uh, it's also in Pendrecht scheme, the core of the district where everything comes together. And also the smaller units have a core, an empty space for the community or the neighborhood or the, let's say the, the, the collective of inhabitants. But this is important because what people forget, it's not only about the different walks of life. Behind those different walks of life, there's different religions and different political denominations. So what is proposed in this situation is that there is a, in the Dutch situation, you should know the Pillar Society, you have a socialist school, you have a socialist union, you have a socialist housing corporation, just as you have, would have a Catholic one, you would have several Protestant denominations, and because of the freedom of education that we have in Holland, and the, the, the religious education in Holland is sponsored through the welfare state system, uh, all these schools are here put together. Van Eyck would uh, design those, of course, with Daniel van Ginkel, and Bakema would uh, design one of the churches. And the interesting thing is that, of course, that these pillars, which are closed communities, especially in those years of the 70s and uh, 40s and 50s, and up into the 60s, because to bring them together in this core, they connect, or there's a possibility to connect. So here, you can say there's a notion of the open society, how it translates into these modernist schemes. Again, very different from what's happening in France, in the banlieue or the English council housing estates. 
so here you see Bakama sketch of Nagelen. And so this, this, this vast open space of the polder, uh, the trees that, that create an inner space and more inner spaces nested. And then this, this is Bakama's church. Again, about yeah, here you see when it's just finished and you see the ruthlessness of the Dutch polder scape and the workers that the land workers were brought here after a selection, whether they were healthy and sane, etc. So the welfare state is, is uh, yeah, it's also about uh, disciplining your people. <laughs> it's certainly at this point. Uh, well, it's a beautiful little church. It's still there. You can go there. It's very radical in its uh, stark and austere uh, uh, architecture. Very minimalist, but uh, executed in a quite uh, perfect uh, way. Uh, it's definitely a Protestant church, of course. And here again, you see, so from the little inner court, and so again, this idea of enclosure and then creating relations to the outside of that enclosure, that's always part of this uh, approach. Um, very big jump to Berlin. Uh, this is again the Smithsons. Hauptstadt Berlin, competition 58. So this is the same year as this church was built. Uh, and it is my speculation that Bachmann got it from the Smithsons, this term, the open society, because when the Smithsons go and join this competition, they start to talk about Berlin as the open city um, and as an example of this project, at least, that they were striving for an open society that was also a society of mobility. Eh? Uh, social mobility was important and literal uh, car mobility is important. And not the church is the center here, but science and ration, ration, uh, rationalism is the center here. Um, I mean, that relates, of course, also to Karl Popper. They never talk about Karl Popper, but part of Karl Popper's notion of the open society is, of course, that criticism towards authority is necessary, it should always be allowed, and it should be based on rational arguments. So a lot of what's happening today, I would say, is there's a lot of criticism, but it's hardly ever a real rational argument that's being made. Anyway. I'm not in favor of technocracy, but uh, sometimes um, too much irrationality is taking over some of the feeds. Uh, this is Bakema's approach, also very much about car traffic, and it's very diagrammatic, but you know, maybe the map of Berlin with the Spree here, the Reichstag is here, this is the Tiergarten, of course, and the Unter den Linden, here's the Museum Inzo, where Chipperfield built this beautiful project and Shinko, of course. Um, and this is, again, the notion of the core, the city core, uh, with all sorts of cultural stuff, uh, but again, mixing things with mega structures. Look at this. Uh, this, is, this was Bakma's proposition for Berlin. Um, and this, this is related to the project in Tel Aviv, in Amsterdam, for Eindhoven, uh, etc. So it's something that he tries to pursue all the time. Uh, and fails, um, I would say. Um, you see the enormous amount of space designated to car traffic. Is that the new sort of wealth, the new sort of well-to-do for the masses, or when we move to America, is that also creating the new uh, segregation? So Bakama was teaching a lot in the States. Uh, as of 1957, his first trip to Boston, he would go there almost on a yearly basis, uh, teaching at various places. These are posters for the uh, as you can see, the university at Buffalo, New York University in Buffalo. And the open society is the big thing. This is in uh, 78. Uh, but it's 
always it's always there and he whenever he would teach not only in the states uh, but also in different places uh, for in salzburg the summer academy he would do for many years in hamburg and in many other places he would also go into local issues in a workshop based way uh, in which the students would have quite a proper uh, a big say in the development of the project here he is in st louis he was a guest professor in st louis in 1959, um, Pesano, I think the dean, uh, invited many of the Team 10 uh, members to go there. Aldo van Eyck would uh, visit St. Louis after Bakerman. Um, and it's again workshop based, and this is again about the core of the city of St. Louis. I went there at the invitation of Eric, Eric Mumford. Um, to talk about Bakama's visit there and what he presented. Uh, it was quite influential visit because some of his students would also become uh, teachers there, for instance, at the school. Um, and it was connected to uh, the city's project of redesigning the inner city, as you can see. The Sarinen uh, Ark was not built yet, built yet or just starting. And well, this is of course one of the big things because St. Louis is this, and still is astonishingly and disgracefully, this segregated city. So Bakama would talk about his problems at least in the lectures and workshops and also in the Team 10 books. Um, so I quote here. Um, he does this also in Philadelphia and other places. And he says uh, this, in the USA, the hottest part of the planning housing problems is how to replace slums by good built environments. In slums, with people who are poor and being poor in the United States means often that you are black. It is a universal law that the weakest part of existence, if ignored in evolution, can grow to revolutionary force. Uh, he continues, at the moment, the colored part of the population is economically and politically the weakest part. And I think that the towns of America can only be improved if we concentrate on methods of change for these parts. Only this can avoid war revolution. Now, uh, I revisited these quotes uh, because of the Black Lives Matter, of course, and the discussion that we have now in architecture and planning. Um, and of course, it's quite astonishing that, that, I mean, this is from, he started doing this from the 50, I mean, it's, it's just one Dutch architect visiting America. I mean, I don't want to make it too big, but I just want to show that this problem is facing us already for so, such a long time. And in several waves, it's coming back to us as if there's no progress. Eh? So um, we need to think about this, I believe. Because he himself is also not that, that, I mean, it's very ambivalent. So when he looks at the core, this is not really about housing. Housing is involved. Uh, he talks about museums and culture projects. There's a union center because one of the students proposes this. But there's not uh, a museum for black culture, black history, for instance. Um, so being also commissioned as a consultant by the city eh, for, for this studio, that there's, a, there's an entanglement that, that is, is difficult to uh, uh, overlook. So this is again from his little book, uh, A Story About People and Space, it says in Dutch, from the chair to the city. Um, and again, that famous diagram of relations and buildings. How, what will the art of architecture be? What, what can the architecture be for an open society? At least we should build in such a way that everybody can, uh, yeah, uh, find a place that fits uh, him or her, we should say today. <laughs> this is a little project for Bergen, a little, little town at the coast, coastal town. But this is more important. And so this is really about the open society as an inclusive society in, in, in diversity, acknowledging the differences um, and respecting those differences. St. Louis, 
Yeah, here it is in this uh, book uh, from 64. And then he com compares the slums to the famous, notorious Yamasaki uh, scheme, Put Igo. He's not very positive about this, to say the least. He's much more positive about the energy that speaks from the slums. Now, is this, how, how to judge this, how to assess this, right? Is, is, uh, this also happened with uh, looking at the uh, North African architecture by Candelis and Woods and Ecouchard, when they held that the bidonville, the slums were much more interesting and much more inspiring, etc., for architecture than those planned places. And this, this is really, it was great to go there uh, because it's still an empty place. Um, and uh, Eric took me there. It's, it's, it's astonishing to think that this was built in St. Louis, a low-rise city to house the black community. I mean, it's uh, from a Dutch point of view. Um, well, I shouldn't make it a Dutch point of view, a human point of view, quite astonishing. So Bakema made this into a special forum issue, the journal that he uh, edited together with uh, Van Eyck. Here you see Yamasaki's project. You see all this flat development and only here the inner city and skyscrapers. Uh, he would acknowledge, for instance, also the uh, Scottrett trials there. But, did he re but then did he really, or, or, or could he make an impact or not? Uh, well, this is something I like, to, because this is so ambivalent. The welfare state tries to be universal, and then so many people are left out or marginalized. Eh? So the welfare state had no, had no uh, room for uh, gay people. For uh, The welfare state uh, had, was certainly not decolonized, so to speak. Um, women uh, were not empowered, uh, had very little agency until the 70s, uh, by law, by law. Eh? So single women also in the Netherlands could not buy a house for themselves until in the 60s, 70s. They always had to have a signature from either a brother or a father to, stand, eh, to uh, represent them legally. So to end a few collage photos by Lars Buurman of the Bakema projects today. <laughs> this is Eindhoven at all. And the collage part is that he, well, I won't say, maybe you guess. <laughs> the, 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 the bases are many photos. And things look the same and things look different. Um, this is in Tilburg. Oh yeah, this is, this is in Bergen, a very cute little project that is going to be demolished. It's very abstract. It's, it's, uh, I think it's pretty, but, but you know, I'm a sucker for this kind of architecture. And the Bergen people are quite posh, also coastal towns uh, gentrify. They find this too um, sloppy <laughs> uh, and too abstract, I suppose. This is in Tilburg, a mini mega structure. Still there, still functioning well. And this is the line band today. So on that note, Rotterdam today, also gentrifying, but also a super multicultural city, very different from the 50s, of course. So on that note, I stop. <laughs> Brilliant timing. Um, that was absolutely fascinating, Dick, thank you. Um, we've, if you've got questions, would you just let me know in the chat box, please? Um, I mean, I was just reminded of, um, you, you know, the famous Alison Smithson essay, The Violent Consumer, oh, yes. yeah. um, which where uh, you sense a sort of, in, in, the, in the Smithson's case, a sort of a pessimism about the open society um, model, um, kind of that's been learned through experience, the experience of building. Is, is that fair to characterise? Yeah, that way. Yeah, and and I just wondered if if that was a unique situation within the Team Ten family, or or did did, did others? Uh, no, that yeah, there is a certain despair in the Team Ten um, family. Yeah, as as, as they, after um, 
after uh, Giancarlo De Carlo organized in Urbino in 66 a meeting that's a moment of crisis because they're very popular and many people want to join and some of especially Alison and Peter Smith don't want that to happen um, so they rethink of the Team 10 uh, meetings as family meetings, so they migrate into a much more private realm, so to speak. Uh, but when you look at the re-edition of the primer in the introduction, uh, there's all new sorts of statements of belief and where they stay and what, what their convictions are, and they are incredibly critical of the welfare state situation. It's bureaucracy, it's, uh, it's way of enforcing people in a way of life they don't want to uh, live. So it's like templates, formats, standard formats for uh, yeah, ways of living. Um, so they are in a, in a very ambiguous, uh, to say the least, position because they want to build for the welfare states, but they feel they don't get the right means and the right conditions uh, to do so. And, and even Bakema's notion of the open society, I, I think you should understand that it's not just a translation of the welfare state system, but as a criticism of the welfare state system. Uh, because, yeah, in terms of accountability, uh, financial accountability and political accountability, all sorts of redistribution uh, programs are often translated into bureaucracies and institutions and, and well, for creative uh, professionals like architects, but also for, I guess, for citizens. This is an obstacle often, it's a straitjacket. And, and that, that discussion is always there, it's always there, yeah. I mean, you, you mentioned Karl Popper as a, a, a kind of reference uh, point. Um, were there other I mean, connections with kind of actual politicians kind of been ah yes yeah of, uh, uh, well Bakema was very well connected to the Dutch establishment um, he was not political himself but for instance he made sure that at the last CEO meeting at Otterlo the uh, Minister of Culture was uh, there right um, the Smiths in their early years thought of themselves as social democrats and in their earlier writings they referred to Bevan and his writings eh? uh, in place of fear uh, the book by Bevan is often quoted um, but then they they changed their minds in later years and 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 yeah uh, Alison can make some blunt remarks, <laughs> as, as you know very well. So turning to a very conservative opinion, it sometimes seems, but never ever to support uh, neoliberal capitalism, never. Uh, and also you can tell it from their own practice and how they develop their, their practice so throughout the years. They were very loyal to their principles. Uh, and this was very different for Bakema, for instance, who, who was running a very big office at the time and had to think of acquiring jobs, uh, etc., to to keep the machine going, so to speak. Um, uh, but but the idea is that uh, well, this is something I researched quite a lot, of course, for a long time ago. But uh, Alison, in particular, very much speaks, and it's. A little bit naive, but it's also uh, what was commonly shared with architects. So it's a combination of the Swedish model with the American model, a kind of optimist consumerism, optimistic consumerism with a socialist collectivist idea of Sweden. And the Asplund exhibition, Asplund in, in the 30s is very popular. And uh, for her, uh, she didn't visit it, of course, she knew it only from the, from the publications. For her, this uh, symbolized the idea of equality. Uh, and equality didn't mean the straitjacket of the welfare state, but that it was kind of, indeed, as they formulated in the 50s, a basic structure from which you could develop, grow. Uh, so maybe they would be in favor of basic wages or something, <laughs> I don't know, you know this really might, but this notion of a basic thing and then lots of freedom, that's very much part of it. But of course the welfare state system is, 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 is intrusive, right? And it's, uh, 
many people get paranoid of the welfare state system because it comes up with all sorts of regulations. Uh, that's also why I started with this first image. It regulates everyday life. Um, it has a certain reason and certain logic, but it is invasive, yeah. I was just striking in the Smithson's work, there's a sort of recurrent preoccupation with um, the place apart, the, 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 the private uh, territory. Uh, mm. And what is notable that, you know, where, uh, there are, as opposed to uh, places of encounter, you know, and I wonder how that connects to this idea of the open city. I mean, one thinks of Round Robin Hood Gardens, where there might be a large place of encounter in the centre of the scheme, there's actually the hill that makes the space sort of effectively unusable as a place of gathering. Uh, one thinks of um, the, in The Economist, the, the, the central plaza was a sort of space removed from the city as a, a place of yeah. and quiet yeah. rather than connectivity. Yeah. Um, one thinks of the way that, um, you know, they're in their own lives at the weekends, they would be at Upper Lawn and yeah. bring themselves or even though the, the um, I guess, the House of the Future as a, as a model, it's very much a... It's enclave, quite, uh, yeah. An enclave, it's quite yeah. hard to square yeah. that with this, yeah. this rhetoric about, um, about continuity or open. Yeah, well, that's one of the things they make part of their uh, theory, so to speak. The, the notion of the enclave, there's really a space for you that you own. Uh, it's already there in the competition entry for the Golden Lane housing block. Uh, that's still the most radical proposal, housing proposal I think they made. It's, it's slightly different from, uh, well, Robin Hood Gardens for many different ways, very radical, but the Golden Lane Housing still has this notion of the yard garden, what they say, an open space between the individual units and the collective street, and people can, well, you would say now appropriate that space uh, in different ways. They can make an extra bedroom or a kitchen space or indeed a yard there um so so from i'm not so sure if it's if it uh, it's contradictory um it's paradox that's what i call it a paradox so it's about how all these nests and clusters uh, are interrelated and i think the economist works pretty well but uh, the problem with Robin Hood Gardens is um it was such a, a strange context in which they had to operate um, there is, as I found in the archives, one film called Fly a Flag for Poplar. It's a socialist realist film from the welfare state about the local uh, white community. So just before the migrants move in. And you see, it starts with the shot coming from Blackwall Tunnel and you see just Robin Hood Gardens finished uh, as like a ghost image. And it has been, it's, it's, it's still very hard to understand why the popular borough wanted to have innovative art architects like the Smithsons, why they just parachuted them there. I, th I think they were bound to fail, to be honest, because all, all the welfare state projects from the late 40s, 50s, they were completely vandalized. So in the, in the clippings, the new clippings in the local archive, you can see that and they're so poor in Poplar, the local council is so poor. So whenever there's an open space vandalized or an elevator is vandalized, the, the councillors are at a despair because they don't have a money, the money to repair it. So it's very different from Camden, for instance, you know, where you get all these high profile architects experimenting with nice bourgeois uh, families living there. <laughs> so it's, it's it's a difficult project to i don't think you should see it's it's an extraordinary project and you cannot take it as um, to exemplify a general trend so to speak we've got a question from nick walker nick i'm going to unmute you oh, yeah in shall i read it hi uh, hi all right oh, nick, there you are yeah <laughs> um thank you very much for a fantastic talk really really interesting wonderful um drawings um, it's more of a sort of a general question, I suppose. It's it's about um, approaches to housing and uh, whether society influenced uh, was influenced by architecture or architecture influenced society. So I suppose in the UK, 
uh, I mean, this is broadly speaking, but the general public seem quite averse to modern ways of living. And there seems to be a sort of a, a trend back towards a more traditional sort of aesthetic and um, uh, approach to housing. Um, but you get the impression that in the Netherlands, that's very different. And there's still a lot of experimentation in terms of how people live and uh, what buildings look like. Yeah. And I, what, I mean, I think in the UK, part of that sort of um, regression is to do with the um, um, disasters of the 1960s and comprehensive redevelopment. Um, but I wonder if there's something very different about Dutch society um, and the way people have been influenced by architecture. Yeah. Or are there actually Dutch citizens who, who are more traditional? We just don't get to hear about them. And <laughs> the one thing you always hear about it when, whenever you go to the Netherlands is the influence of Calvinism and the mm. fact that you have very large windows because um, the Calvinist religion sort of um, abhorred the ideas of, um, of hiding. And so everyone has large windows and it's very open. But I'm also interested in that in terms of how that might change because obviously um, Dutch society is, is far more um, culturally um, diverse now. Mm. Ah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Now, <laughs> I could talk another hour. <laughs> I try not to do it. Um, related to the British situation, one of the things, so I, came, I was granted this very generous uh, fellowship, uh, the Richard Rogers Fellowship, to visit Britain in the, well, it's already three years ago. And, as, and I never realized then, because I started to study the council housing system, it's completely centralized. This is one of the crazy things of the British system, I would say. That the national minister has the last say about funding, financing, and uh, what councils can do in terms of uh, housing policies. Uh, which I think is totally empire style. Uh, uh, so the working classes, the lower classes are controlled by the national minister in London. This is totally different in Holland. In Holland, the, of course, there's national government too, but the local councils have much more power here in terms of housing uh, policies and developing uh, policies tailored to their actual local needs uh, rather than these gigantic national programs. It's of course a little bit, I'm now contrasting it, uh, but, but, but the, the negotiations in Holland, so again, let's say a democratic process, but within the institutions, the local councils have much more power than the ones in Britain. And it's, it, and it's astonishing to see that, that, that uh, labor councils are forced to sell off housing estates to get some money uh, to spend on other things, services, etc. Because they're, they're completely strangled uh, by uh, national policies. I mean, this is my first advice. <laughs> Get rid of this centralization. De Decolonize yourself. Decolonize England <laughs> and your government institutions. The other thing is, um, modernism in England was on the islands, was always looked at very suspiciously because in the 20s and 30s, it came with revolution on the continent. Russian avant-garde came with socialism and also in Germany, all nobility was just uh, thrown out, of course, and disowned uh, after the F First World War, after the Great War. Such revolution never happened in Britain. So what, what happened uh, after the war when Niklaus Pessner and um, oh no, I forgot his name, Richards, of the Architectural Review, wanted to bring England, Britain, the uh, modern architecture project. They came with a certain, certain soft modern architecture that they found in Sweden, which was not socialist, but social democratic. And they basically wanted to make modern architecture acceptable to the British institutions. To a certain extent, they succeeded because there are certain beautiful modernist architects, uh, architecture there uh, available. Um, 
which we don't have. Uh, so, uh, but uh, but ever since Thatcher came back to power and council housing was rejected as a possible positive project to create an inclusive society for every for really for everyone. Um, yeah, this this was a moment of regression. Yeah. But for but for to, so so if 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 we think of today and the housing crisis today, so one of the things is that is 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 that we there's a kind of global housing system at the moment in place. There's a, there's, there's a lobby groups uh, working on our governments. Also, Amsterdam is flooded with uh, foreign uh, developers at the moment, which which is is boosting the prices here and driving people out of the city, especially lower class, of course, but also. Middle classes. So what you need is to achieve a multi-system uh, approach. I think that that there are real options, um, uh, and that you can choose what fits your way of life and your budget, so to speak. But because in, if you can only choose, if you can only choose something through a market system, that's not a real thing to do. So you need to be able to organize collective arrangements. A new thing in Holland is uh, the housing cooperatives, which have been active in the German speaking countries for a long time already, very successful, very interesting, really bottom up things. And that, that is well, a more theoretical approach is these notions of today are agency and appropriation, of course. And we must make sure that there is agency with the inhabitants. Mm. Uh, let's say the consumers. I don't like the word consumer or I don't like the word end user, etc. It's no end user in my view. But uh, inhabitants and local communities need to have proper agency indeed. And because of the centralized system in England, they don't have it. Uh, and appropriation is interesting for architects, I think, to think about uh, how can you create design concepts that are open, like an opera, <laughs> opera aperta, as Umberto Eco says, that, that the inhabitant becomes an author, so to speak, of his or her own environment. Uh, there are all sorts of, and also there you can choose as yeah, things that you open, complete loft spaces that you have to finish, or just uh, allotments, plots or indeed uh, turnkey projects if you prefer that. So, 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 so the promise of the market economy that is freedom of choice should finally be delivered. <laughs> and uh, apparently we need more left-wingish institutions to uh, help us with that. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, I'm seeing um, Stephen Boxall making a comment, control over council housing in England from the center is because it's the only way neoliberalism yeah. could be imposed at local yeah. level. Yeah. I um, totally agree, yeah. But I'm afraid we are um, a bit of time, but it was absolutely fascinating um, just um, to hear someone so in command of their subject um, and uh, such a good communicator, that was a treat. Um, so yeah, as I say, D Dirk's, um, dig out Dirk's previous contribution, which is um, um, in the, the, the session that Penelope Curtis led um, a few weeks ago.